the Q&A portion of today's talk. Uh, as most of you know, please uh, don't raise your hand and ask questions directly, but uh, you should have gotten a piece of paper when you came in. Please write your questions on the paper, and one of our volunteers will pass them up to me, and I will direct the questions to today's speaker. So, Angela, thank you for your talk. Let's start off a little bit more about Angela. So, <laughs> you, uh, you've been in Korea for one month, uh, but my understanding is this is not your first time in Korea. You've been here before. Can you tell us about your past, uh, when you were in Korea before, and maybe some of your other stops? Well, you mentioned uh, Indonesia, some other places you've been working for the Institute. Okay, yeah, it's true. I have been in Korea before, from 2003 to 2005, working as a visiting professor at a university in Daejeon. However, I'm very sorry to say that I forgot all my Korean. <laughs> I learned it then, and I'm told I was able to speak quite well. <coughs> After that, I went to Madagascar and to Indonesia, and I learned those languages too. <laughs> so now I come back and I remember words, and sometimes I'm in a situation and something comes back, and I think, yes, I know that. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Um, in fact, for 20 years I have had a very nice, very special Korean friend still from my university days. So she was the reason I heard about this job offer at the time of this university in Daejeon. And then I said, yeah, why not? I mean, she's been studying in Germany. I'm, why don't I go to Korea to see um, how it is there? Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us briefly what is your educational background and how did you get the start with the Goethe Institute? Yeah, I studied linguistics because I love languages. And so, um, more or less, more, all of my life I've been dealing with that and I've been wanting to go abroad to discover different countries, to know how people live, how people think. And after finishing university, by chance, I got a post as a German teacher. And I think nobody ever says, I want to become a German teacher. People just somehow end up in that profession. <laughs> it was the same for me. So then, right after university, I went to Madagascar for my first teaching post at university there. Um, after that came this Korea episode, and at the time I started working for Goethe as a, um, what is that called, honorary teacher? No, as a teacher on an hourly basis. Adjunct. No? Adjunct. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> That's a French expression, I'm sorry. Um, ever since I felt that I really enjoyed teaching language to people who have the aim of going to Germany. Most of our students or any students want to go to university in Germany, so they are very, very motivated. And yeah, the post in Indonesia, however, was the first where I was not teaching, but being responsible for this institute on, uh, on, on the whole. It's getting busy. It's getting really busy. Your, uh, your talk has generated a lot of interest and a lot of interesting questions. We won't uh, grill you too hard, though. Um, so, <laughs> uh, can you talk about maybe uh, staying on the topic of you being in Korea? Can you talk about what's, what's something that you like most about Korea? And can you think of any potential overlaps in the culture of Korea and Germany? Well, something I really enjoy here is the food, always has been, and I've, ever since I was here I thought I have to go back, it's so delicious, and I'm very happy to be in Guangzhou, which is a reputation for um, ex excellent cuisine in Korea, and I absolutely have to agree. Um, what I very much like here as well is uh, the people. It, everybody has been very welcoming, very warm, very open, and I meet so many interesting people all the time, so that's a real treasure for me. Parallels between Korea and Germany. Maybe the diligence that 
people are hard working, they are disciplined, they are motivated, so maybe that's the same. What I enjoy here, all in spite of that, is it's not just work, work, work. When work is done, it's very easy to go and have fun with the colleagues, with other people. So yeah, there's, there are those both sides, work and spending a good time together. Okay. Let's move on to the Goethe Institute specifically. Um, why is the Goethe Institute called the Goethe Institute? <laughs> <laughs> and why is there this strange spelling with O-E and nobody ever knows how to say it right? <laughs> um, maybe some of you are familiar with the name Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He is I think the most important, most famous German author from, when did he live? Ooh, I don't want to say something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he died in 1832. Thank you. I was thinking 18th century. Yeah. So he wrote a lot of uh, novels, of poems, but he was not only a, a literate in the sense of author, he was also a scientist, so he, he did research on different subjects, he had opinions on philosophy, on natural science. It's what we would call today a universal genius, so to say. Um, and that was the reason why his name was chosen for the Goethe Institute. To say this is one of the most famous Germans um, and it conveys a good idea of what we want to do. Okay, um, so we have some a few people who are interested in the locations for these institutes and the cities that you mentioned specifically as being the sort of central hubs. Uh, so why was Seoul chosen for Northeast Asia? Why not someone somewhere in China or Japan, and also why, why those eight cities that you mentioned? What's the criteria for choosing those eight cities? Um, I think the reason why it is eight is that there should be one on every continent, more or less. You might ask why is nothing in Australia? Well, Australia is integrated into the Southeast Asian region. Um, with respect to the choice of cities, actually I'm not quite sure. I mean, New York seems obvious to me in a way, being a cultural city as well. Um, maybe it's, like for Johannesburg, it's accessibility. Because in Africa it's very difficult, difficult to travel, even when flying. So Johannesburg is one of the cities which is easiest to reach from everywhere. Seoul, in fact, is recent uh, regional headquarters. Before it was uh, in Japan, in Tokyo. Why it has been moved to Seoul, I don't know. But I'm very happy that it is, because it shows Korea really is important to the work of Goethe Institute. Well, let's talk about the presence of the Goethe Institute in Korea. Why should a Korean study German? What are some of the most apparent uh, <laughs> benefits of a Korean for learning German? Especially with the German reputation of being so complicated with all that strange grammar. <laughs> um, for most people, really, the motivation is studying in Germany because in some areas the German university system is highly reputed. Um, in Korea the main focus is on music and arts. So I know a lot of my, yeah, my students here, they say, um, I don't know, I'm, someone is stu um, studying to become a flutist, and she says, I want to play with the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. So I want to go there, I want to get further study possibilities there and then come back. For others it might be engineering or what else do we have, philosophy. There are a lot of people who study theology and want to get further um, formation in Germany. All these are regions in which 
my home country's culture and academic fields have a high reputation in the world. What is in favor of Germany maybe is too that the tuition fees at universities are lower than in some other countries. So that might play a role too. Yeah. And what I'm happy to know is that even when people go to Germany, then they come back to their native country here to Korea and they bring back what they learned abroad and it gets part of the life and the culture here. Okay, moving on to the study itself. Uh, can you just clarify what is the language of instruction uh, at a Goethe Institute anywhere in the world? Do you incorporate the local language or is German the language of instruction? It is, at least it should be. <laughs> so that is one of our quality criteria. We say from the beginning, from the first day, German is the language of the classroom. Of course, sometimes teachers switch to English or to Korean or to Indonesian if something is completely lost. But in general, the language of instruction is German. And in fact, now that I'm hearing Guangzhou, that is one of the reasons people come to us. They say, you have German teachers here, we want to come to study there because we only speak German. And yeah, obviously, as I said, I forgot my Korean, so no work with me. I have to speak German. I have a colleague who is a Korean born and raised in Germany. So he speaks both languages, but in classroom, again, it's only German. Okay, and just to clarify, the uh, mission and approach doesn't change based on location. It's a unified uh, approach, is that correct? That's true. Although, of course, there might be individual focus depending on the region or the country. In some country, for cultural aspects, this might be a priority. Something else might be neglected. There is variation, but the three pillars and the principles stay the same. One of the pillars you mentioned was culture. Um, are there any common misconceptions about German language or culture that you would like to dispel? Oh, how much time do I have to do that? It's a good question. Maybe, maybe it's not a misconception, but what I just mentioned, the reputation of German being a hard language to learn. Because usually people compare it to English. And in many countries, people forget, in a way, that they have such a long, language, long history of learning ang lang oh. <laughs> English in school. They start very early, sometimes in preschool, then in <coughs> primary school. So when they come to learn German, maybe now when they're in university, they have several years of English, and they start from zero learning German. And of course, that is hard. That is hard compared to their current level of English. But when they had 10 years of learning German, I'm sure they will be very fluent and have a good level as well. So the grammar is different, yes. And I myself sometimes get confused with daddy does and all those things. Some of you surely aren't familiar with it. But that's a relative difficulty, I think. And anybody who's motivated, who works on it, is able to learn the language very well. Staying on the topic of culture, are there any, is there any presence or effect of Korean culture within Germany? Um, in general, I cannot answer, but in my personal history, in my family, yes. In the movie, you saw those nurses. And that was part of, of one of the first contracts. Germany needed help. So a lot of Korean nurses came to Germany and my aunt was one of them. So in, in my family there always has been somebody from Korea and talking of course of their home country and preparing delicious dishes. Um, I think in general With respect to the World Cup, 
many people got interested into Korea. And maybe I can add something from Indonesia, where I've spent the last three and a half years. In Southeast Asia, Korean youth culture is the ideal. So everybody watches Korean drama and series on, on DVD. Um, they learn Korean, they listen to Korean music, and I always thought that's just fascinating, really. They have the same haircuts, the same haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> There, there is quite a distinct influence, definitely. Um, I think the uh, past history of Germany as a divided country uh, that has been since unified and the current state of the Korean peninsula as a divided, con a divided peninsula has generated a lot of interesting questions. Um, Let's first start with, what is the extent of the Goethe Institute's reach into North Korea so far, something you mentioned briefly, and what are the plans for the future with the Institute in North Korea? Um, as I've only been here for a little over one month, I'm not that deep uh, into this information. I know, for example, that there are cultural programs being sent to North Korea. And I remember reading on the website of Goethe Institute Seoul that I think there was a movie screening series quite recently. So at the, at the current stage it's more or less like this. Cultural Corporation sending some events to there. How it will develop in the future, I'm sorry I cannot say now because I'm, I'm not informed about that. So from someone who experienced the reunification of Germany, can you talk about the cost versus the benefit of reunification? <laughs> and what, why do you think it was so successful in Germany? Who now we're getting to the big questions again. <laughs> well, I know that this issue raises a lot of interest. It has for quite some time and I think in Korea there is an institute dealing with the reunification and they follow the process very closely and uh, what happened in Germany. The cost was huge as far as I know um, and even though Germany currently is one of the strongest nations economically seen in Europe the cost of unification has been high and until today play a role. So I don't I cannot give any numbers, but everybody feels and says it has been worth it. Now the country is one again, difficulties slowly start to, to get away. With respect to infrastructure, obviously it's easier than with respect to the way people think, with respect to their history. But there is a lot of um, exchange and work being done as well. well. There's a little bit more about that really big topic, but I think <laughs> we should have time for only one more question and maybe leave, leave the uh, socio-political <laughs> things aside for now. So getting back to the language side of things, and this will be our final question for today. If uh, your question wasn't answered, please feel free to talk to the speaker directly. So uh, I think we would appreciate a very quick free German lesson. Uh, <laughs> someone in the audience, someone in the audience wants to know how to say thank you in German because I think they want to thank you for today. <laughs> Danke. Danke. Okay. So let's all tell Angela Danke for answering our questions for today. Thank you, Angela. Danke. Bye.